Hello and welcome to our fourth teaching and teaching and learning webinar. This evening we're going to introduce you to Gary and John. And um, my name's Avril Townsend. I've been teaching for nearly 20 years and I've been a head of science and I'm currently a lead practitioner of science. Hello everyone, my name is Gary Talbot, welcome. We've got people from all over the world, which is amazing. Uh, welcome to this, the Science of Learning webinar. Uh, it's really exciting to um, see so many of you here already. Uh, we're gonna make a start now. Uh, my name is Gary Talbot and I've been teaching for uh, just over 10 years um, and I'm currently a lead practitioner and head of e-learning at a secondary school um, in the UK. Um, we, we're really, really excited to uh, announce our special guest, John Tate, and agreeing to help us with this. Um, so I'll introduce him in a second. But before I do that, just a couple of sort of house rules. Um, so this is a, a webinar, so we can't see you or we can't hear you, but hopefully you should be able to see and hear us. Um, for communication tonight, there are two sort of features in the webinar thing. If you've not used it before, there's a Q&A section so as John's talking throughout his presentation, if there's something, a question that is, is, you know, is a burning question that you want to ask John, just pop that in the Q&A section. And when we come uh, to the end of the webinar, we'll have a bit of time where we can pose those questions uh, to John. And um, just try and be specific as you can with your question. And um, so that we know we're, we're sort of asking John uh, at the end. And then there's also the chat function where you can sort of discuss things with colleagues, um, things that have, um, that you might come up, things that you might have used, what John's talking about, uh, that you might want to share with colleagues uh, tonight. So use that chat function for that. And then we're also going to try something a little bit more interactive tonight. So we're going to try and get you doing something and, and, and collaborating in discussion. So there will be opportunities in the webinar for you to um, discuss or give us your thoughts on various questions and ideas. And you'll see that sort of sit the symbol in the bottom right hand corner when we want you to do that. And we'll explain how to do it. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it will work. Um, if not, we'll just use the, the chat function. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome our special guest, John Tate. Um, so thank you, John, for, for joining us. And uh, it's over to you. Thank you, Gary. And, and thank you very much for everyone tuning in tonight. Um, my name is John Tate. I am a multi-academy trust uh, deputy CEO here in the UK. I've been teaching for uh, nearly 20 years now, it'll be 20 years this year. My role as a Deputy CEO is the Director of School Improvement across three schools in um, North Yorkshire, up in the north uh, east of England. Uh, and I'm also an education author and uh, I've written uh, four books now and I'll be talking about one of them tonight. Um, and if you want to hook up with me on any one of your kind of chosen or favourite social media platforms, then feel free to do so uh, tonight uh, or afterwards. And I'd be certainly happy to, um, you know, to answer any questions, you know, further in, in, into uh, into the next few days if you've got anything that actually comes up. Okay. Um, what I wanted to start with is, uh, let me see if I can shift it across now. Uh, hang on. Yeah. What I wanted to start with is um, because there's so many of us around the world, I thought it'd be really, really nice for you to, at some point, either either straight away um, or later on, I've got a slide that will remind you towards the end to take a selfie of yourself. At, at your desk, wherever you are on the world, wherever you're watching this, and use the, the hashtag that's on the screen there, TNT Science of Learning. And uh, whether that's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, or whether it is uh, Instagram um, or, or LinkedIn, whatever, whatever it is, it'd be great to see as many of us kind of, you know, getting involved in this and uh, really feeling a sense of really kind of global collaboration really tonight, wherever you are from. And it's been great to see so many of you that have put where you're from in the chat to start with. It's also I've, I've been smiling when, um, when when we were kind of getting going there because I was I was I was I was amused at some of the responses to the first uh, to the first task really and some of the things we're obviously all in the same boat in our schools about ordering blue roll you know picking up masks from the floor making sure our pods are you know and, and not kind of cross contaminated so we're obviously all facing the same issues in our schools at the moment um, but yeah if you want to get involved in that. Take a quick selfie of you kind of you know at your at your kind of uh, your laptop at the moment um send it in and i think that that would be great for, for us all to see where everyone's collaborating from okay um <clears throat> on to really the, the the main kind of the, the content side and um i want to really talk to you about the science of learning but really you know, my kind of inspiration behind it has been i really feel that there's been a lot of hidden truths of learning that i'm starting to come to terms with over the last few years of my career and i was 
I suppose, quite worried that maybe I'd missed these, um, the foundation of, of, of how students learn and how, how adults learn, really, how human beings learn. Because I came through a slightly different route into teaching. I did what we call here in the UK the graduate teacher program uh, about 20 years ago, which some of you might recognise now as something like um, you know, a school direct program. So it wasn't the traditional program. And I thought that I'd maybe I'd missed out on things like retrieval practice um, and spacing and interleaving and dual coding and cognitive load. And I, so for, for a few years, I was not wanting to talk to, to many people about it because I thought everyone knew about it apart from me. And I felt maybe a little bit of a fraud. But then as I started getting a bit of confidence and wanting to talk to people about it, I suddenly started to realise that actually everyone was in the same boat and that uh, there, were, there were hardly anyone, you know, any, any people in the profession that really did know about it. So it really frustrated me that actually we needed, you know, as a profession, we need to know about this. So that certainly drove me to write my new book, which is what I'm going to be talking to you about sections of that tonight, which is this idea that we need to really reboot our teaching with the science of learning. And um, we're going to, I'm going to talk to you about various aspects of that tonight. The key aspects that I think are some of the most important bits of, of what we really need to know as educators, uh, as school leaders, classroom teachers, whatever you may be tonight. And I really feel that irrespective of geography, so whether you are in Mexico, whether you are in Middlesbrough, it doesn't really matter. This is how children learn, how, how human beings learn, uh, and, and, the, and the best conditions, the most fertile learning conditions. And it also doesn't matter whether you are a primary teacher, a secondary teacher, you know, a, a university lecturer. Again, this is how people learn. So this is not phase specific, and it's certainly not geography specific to any one country uh, or location. So hopefully this will this will mean lots to uh, you know to, to lots of you tonight. So. The question is, so why has it been, why has, have these truths been hidden for so long? Um, and I think the first thing, it, it, I really feel it's been inaccessible. So a lot of the evidence that we're now reading and we're now understanding has been inaccessible. And what I mean by that is that they have maybe been behind a paywall or we've not known where to access it. Or maybe the fact that it's been written by academics, uh, researchers, professors, and, you know, it's, it's maybe been too long. You know, who, who has, who's got time to read a hundred page report? Um, you know, that, that ultimately is very academic in its nature. So I think that we, we may have missed it for these reasons. There's also been lots of misconceptions <clears throat> and um, we have read into research in, in different ways and we've taken, uh, you know, we, we've made misconceptions about what things actually mean. The perfect example I feel about this is the research that has been there for, for quite a while that was uh, by the, um, the Education Endowment Foundation, by the Sutton Trust, by John Hattie, that talks about, about, about feedback being the king, really, and feedback being the biggest tool in our armory as teachers to, to really push students forward. But unfortunately, we have taken that as a profession. Um, we've made a misconception about that meaning marking. And it never really talks about marking. It talks about feedback. And we all know feedback can come in many, many uh, forms that don't just, don't just recall red pen on some work. But we've made that misconception over, over a long period of time. It's also been miscommunicated, uh, either indirectly or directly or intentionally or unintentionally miscommunicated. So people go on courses or they read books and they come back and, and, they, think, and they, they communicate to staff about what they think it is. And actually, it's very, very different from that. And lastly, we have a confirmation bias, which is really interesting that actually we, um, unfortunately, as human beings, we search for information that, um, that aligns with our beliefs. You know, we don't want to go and read something that tells us we're wrong. So what we do is when we find something that's wrong or that doesn't is not in tune with what our beliefs are about what works in our classrooms, we tend to dismiss that quite easily. And when we find something that agrees with us, we're then quite easy to say, see, I told you I was right. So we have this built into us, which is really quite damaging. And we need to understand that we, we need to be very more, very much kind of seeing both sides of the coin rather than just, uh, you know, following our beliefs all the time. So I think we need, to, we need to have a more medical approach to our craft. And I think that if we think about doctors and nurses and, and medical practitioners in your country, you would be probably quite horrified if you took your children to uh, the doctors and they had no evidence or no research behind the medicine they were using. And they were just trying things out on you. I, I think you'd be quite worried about that. So we need to make sure that this science of learning is more of a medical approach and we're actually... You know, we, we, there are reasons why we use things, not just our gut reaction or our gut feeling, but actually really things that, that, that actually work uh, and that are underpinned by some research. So we need, to, we need to understand what works because our students have one chance at education and you know, we, we, 
if you've got children yourself, I suppose you'd be quite worried if you were sending them to schools where they were trying things out you know, that they didn't know worked or they were they were just giving things a go. I think it's important to make sure we understand how that works, that it's research informed, uh, not research led necessarily, and we're not dictated by research, but research informed. And what I mean by that is that we use that research to uh, in increase our knowledge around a situation. We use our gut reactions. We, we use our contextual knowledge of our, of our schools and the research. And together, we then put that together and then make sound decisions as school classroom teachers, as leaders, rather than just being led by research. And lastly, to making sure we have a firm understanding of cognitive science, because ultimately that's where I feel I've missed out on as a teacher until the last few years. Um, you know, really how students understand information, how they retain information uh, and, and the best fertile learning conditions. And, and certainly I have, I have missed out on that. Like I've been speaking to lots of people, they've missed out on it as well. So my wish from this and, and my wish from, from writing my book and talking to you tonight is that senior leaders know more about this. The people who lead our schools need to understand this uh, and we need to know what the best learning conditions are because actually if we don't, then we can't be running our schools as effectively as we, as, as we could. My wish is also that trainee teachers are at the point of entry to the profession. So trainee teachers start to understand this as part of their teacher training. I feel I'm doing lots and lots of retraining uh, and training teachers out of old habits at the moment because they haven't understood this at, at, the, at the point of entry in the profession. So that's really key for me to make sure we get this right at the point of entry to the profession and not five, 10, 15 or 20 years down the line having to retrain people. I wish that as an NQT I'd have known this because I would have made far better decisions in the first 10 to 15 years of my career. Um, I could have you know, moved learning on with lots of other students in lots of different ways. And I also wish that my teachers that taught me when I was at school would have known about this because I think that they would have made some better decisions with me. Um, and I think that there could have been lots more learning gains rather than some of the mistakes uh, you know, that we've all seen. So that's my wish really for, for where we are. So I wanted to start by, by throwing a question out to you. And we've got a Jamboard there, uh, a link which, which uh, Gary's gonna go through in a second. But I just wanted to see if anybody at the moment uh, have, 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 you know, that you know that you've used some classroom activities previously that you really, really firmly believed in at the time, but ultimately now you actually, you know, it's underpinned by myth rather than evidence. And, and you're thinking, why, why, why did I used to do that? And, but I really believed in it. So if there's anything at all that you have previously used that you really believed in, that now you know from what you've read, from what you've been shown, from what you understand now, has been literally underpinned by myth rather than evidence. So Gary, are we gonna, are we gonna fire that uh, jam board up and get people to collaborate on that? Yeah, so what you need to do, I'm just gonna copy and paste this link and put it into the chat. So give me one second. Here we go. So you should be able to click on that link uh, now. Oh, here we go. Sorry about that. I'm just copy and pasted the wrong thing. Here we go. So you should be able to click on that link now at the, in the chat. And then I'm just going to share my screen of the Jamboard. So hopefully you should be able to see the Jamboard. Um, if you click on that link, you will see here, we've got the question which John has just asked. And then on the left hand side, if you've not used Jamboard before, there is a post-it note, a sticky note. If you click on that, you can just type in your answer and change the colour of the sticky note. Um, and then just save it and it should come up on the Jamboard. And then you can just move it around wherever you want onto the screen. So we'll try and get as many people to fill up this Jamboard with questions as possible. And we'll give a couple of minutes for you to do that. Interesting, Gary, already I'm seeing some things on there um, that are quite common with people at the moment, uh, that, you know, that they, they did believe in them previously. Um, certainly, you know, learning styles, Lee's bottom there, uh, which I, th I think I think that's what he means in terms of VAK, in terms of visual audit auditory and kinesthetic, in terms of we've all told that we, we have to adjust our things for different learning, uh, learning styles. Uh, restricting teacher talk, I've just seen flying across the screen. I remember a few years ago when I was a senior leader told that you know, if you were observing a lesson and somebody spoke for more than a certain amount of minutes and it couldn't be graded as a good lesson or an outstanding lesson, uh, which, you know, absolutely ridiculous. But again, that, that, that was floating around at some point. Wow, there's loads going on. I'm trying to keep up with them all now. <laughs> Learning styles on there again. 
multiple intelligences, uh, engage in hooks even if it wasn't linked to learning, sitting students in ability groups, uh, competitions, ability groups, um, heavy on exam questions, yeah, yeah, teaching to the test. Um, interestingly, learning styles has come up quite a few times, doesn't it, already? That yeah. seems to be like obviously the, the, almost the number one that, that people were, we were all led to believe this was ultimately the way it is. Uh, three or four way differentiation. Um, yeah, sitting in rows, but it's now back again because of COVID. Yeah, those things going in and out of fashion in terms of rows. I, mean, I remember being told that if you sat students in rows, it was very old fashioned and it all had to be group work and, and group tables. And then suddenly back to kind of rows and, and more teacher talk from the front potentially in terms of director lessons. Um, yeah, some interesting things there. Kagan, interesting, yeah. Uh, writing the date and copying the learning objective. I wrote a blog post on that. That, that, we talk, that I, I titled it, I think it was 57 hours writing learning objectives. And I kind of basically, you know, did a, a rough estimation of three minutes a lesson times by five lessons a day, times by five lessons a week, times by, you know, 38 or 39 lessons, a, you know, a week, weeks a year. And it is, it's, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. So, wow, there are lots and lots of things coming in. So, yeah, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Lesson blocking, we're going to talk about that as well. Um, wow, some great collaboration on there. So, Gary, should we leave that there? Do you want to come back yeah. to that? And, uh, you know, yeah, so we will, yeah, we will send these jam boards out as well to everyone via email. So, you've got a copy of these. Um, and then you can see what other people have put. So, we'll go back to the presentation now, John. Perfect. I just saw a three-part lesson come up there as well. That was a that was a favourite at some point, <laughs> like a blast from the past. That was it was a, it was a, a, a good activity to shift forward with there. Okay, so that did kind of get us warm and thinking about the things that we thought that used to um you used to kind of uh, we used to believe in really you know r r rather than uh, rather than what we know now. Okay, let's uh, let's move forward. Um, move forward, guy. I'm just. Okay, so we're, we're going to look at the science of learning, and there's, there's three themes we're going to explore. Um, we're going to look at spacing and interleaving, and I think that for me, uh, lots of people get this wrong, and they talk about spacing and interleaving as one thing. So when I hear them talk, they talk about spacing and interleaving, almost if it's one word. So we're going to look at that tonight. We're going to look at the, the differences. We're going to look at learning versus performance, and actually what we're really assessing. Are we assessing learning? Are we assessing performance? Is there a difference? And we're also going to look at cognitive load and dual coding. And that's kind of hot on a lot of people's lips at the moment. What I will say right from the offset now is that we're going to look at a really like an overview tonight uh, to really get you thinking about what it is, what it isn't, and hopefully spark your creativity, your imagination, your deep thinking for you to go off and look at these further. Um, because clearly we could probably do a webinar on every single individual area of those. We're going to do a quick overview tonight, what it is, what it isn't, what the research says in terms of sound bites and how you can implement it quickly into your classroom. And then hopefully, like I say, it'll spark you to think about how you can look, look, look at these in a bit more de deeper detail. Um, and each section of those three, I'm going to structure it in the same way. So the first one, we're going to look at Teacher 1.0. Uh, and these kind of areas really are taken from, the, from, from how I've kind of structured it in my book really here. Um, so Teacher 1.0 is what did we used to do? What were the mistakes we've made? Um, and and, and what, what might we all reflect on that we've done before? So this is not good teacher and bad teacher. This is actually, we've all done this. We were probably trained to do this, but now we know that maybe these things are wrong. Secondly, what does the research say? So again, some sound bites on, on what it says. And thirdly, some practical strategies uh, that you can take immediately into your classroom. So that's how each topic is going to be structured, hopefully nice and easy. So if you look for those three icons, uh, the yellow one for Teacher 1.0, uh, the kind of salmon colour one for what does the research say, and the, the, the pencil and the ruler for the, the strategies, you'll know what's going to come up on the, on, the, uh, on the slides. So let's dive into the first one. So like I said, spacing and interleaving. Um, we picked this because lots of people get this wrong. So let's, right from the offset, let's look at what it is. So spacing, okay, it's the length of time we leave between the initial input and asking students to recall something, okay? So if we teach something in week one, how long are we going to leave for them to almost forget it before we come back and ask them to do something with that information? And it's really clear that the evidence talks about we need to actually do something with that information otherwise we're going to lose it. Um, and if it's, as I'll explore in a minute, if we, if we just ask people to do something with that information straight after they've been given it, it's too easy. We almost need to leave a bit of time for students to almost forget that information, to then to then recall it 
because every time we do that and we, we look at retrieval practice that every time we make a successful retrieval it strengthens the memory itself now it, it spacing kind of links into retrieval i haven't decided to do retrieval tonight because i think that's probably one of the areas that's filtered through the classrooms the most at the moment i mean i'm talking to teachers and school leaders lots of people are, are aware of retrieval practice but to do it properly, we've got to make sure that spacing is built in so we leave enough time to forget, to make sure it's difficult enough for students to remember so it makes a deep learning trace. Secondly though, interleaving, and this is where it's different. So interleaving is comparing and contrasting between similar topics, okay? So we can identify the key differences. Um, and what I mean by this, and if I give you an example, if, um, if I was going to teach you to play tennis and we were going to do some forehand, and we, and we stood and I hit balls to your forehand or, or backhand all, all session. You're in the right place. You're stood expecting a backhand. You're stood side on. You've got the grip correctly, waiting to hit it back. It's too easy. When I start to mix that up and I start to then hit a forehand and then a backhand and then a volley and you don't know what's coming next. As I'm starting to mix up those skills, it becomes more lifelike and it becomes more, it becomes more difficult because you're then having to start to compare and contrast where the ball's coming, the pace of it, the direction, and you're having to identify what, what, what um, solution you're going to use for the task. So I need to then change my, my, my grip, my stance, and I need to then hit the ball. So it, it's making sure that we understand those small details. And that's really important because if we're just trying to master one skill, it can be quite easy and we can kind of feel quite comfortable, but life isn't blocked. Life comes at us in different shapes and sizes. And we need to be able to understand the, the little differences between things to then select the right solution. So that's where spacing and interleaving is different. Clearly, when you space, uh, sorry, when you interleave correctly, you will add some spacing in there. But these two are very, very different skills. And I think that's really interesting uh, and important to understand right from the offset that they are different, but they both actually use a little bit of each other. OK, so in our Teach 1.0 section, OK, so what are the things that we've done uh, previously that maybe haven't been in tune with uh, with, you know, with with the research and the science. So I think that first of all, our lack of understanding of, of how to really intelligently design our curriculum <clears throat> and sequencing of lessons uh, has led to the following things for spacing. First of all, blocking, and, I, and somebody put on the on the jam board about blocking. Really important that I think we understand what blocking is, and and traditionally, I suppose, probably it's the way that we've been taught ourselves as students when we were at school. Um, and, it, and it makes sense almost that if we're going to teach one topic, why would we teach a different topic in the middle of that? You know, you, let's just teach the topic from start to finish and then test it at the end. And that's that traditional method of teaching. But actually, we know now that that interleaving and the spacing is really important to give students time to forget, to let them retrieve that information and make their memory stronger, but also to interleave different topics or skills once our students get skilled at it. So actually they can, they can really discern between the small details. Secondly, it hasn't, if we haven't spaced, we haven't really given our students time to work outside of their short term memory. So it can be quite easy if, um, if I give you a test on the things that we talked about tonight, straight after this, you'd probably all do quite well if, you, if you've been listening carefully. But if I started to test you on that in two or three days time or a week's time or in a month's time, It'd be very interesting to see how your scores would rapidly decrease because actually you're not given any time to keep going back at that and, and retrieve that information. So if we're only ever working in, working in our short term memory, then we're doing our students a disservice, especially if you're going to teach something at the start of a two year course and expect them to remember it again at the end of that two year course. It's really, really difficult. Um, so that retrieval is, is really important. And, and, and as we know from retrieval, if we're not if we're not spacing and we're not using that intelligent spacing, we're not giving our students any time to do that. From an interleaving point of view, it's too similar. If we're not interleaving, students become uh, you know they, they get into their comfort zone of knowing what's coming next. If they're doing addition uh, or lesson, or they're doing multiplication, or they're doing you know it, they're in their comfort zone. They know what's coming next. They know the solution to use, and it's too repetitive. Um, and there's also a lack of contrast for them to be able to see those individual fine details. Again, really, really important to get under the skin and know exactly um, you know, more about the solutions rather than just it's the same thing coming at the same time. And, and I think I've mastered that, but I'm not able to contrast the differences between something else. OK, into the research. Then. So what does the research say? Let's look specifically at spacing now and then we'll look at we'll come into it interleaving in, in a second. 
but specifically for spacing, what I'll give you now is some sound bites from the research that hopefully you can really take on board, you can understand, um, and, and again, that, that can really spark some further discussion uh, or thought in your head. So the first thing is Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. Now, notice the date on this, 1885. Yet people are just starting to understand it now. And, and, and I think that's, again, going back to my frustrations of why, you know, why, I've, why I've done this, why I've written my book. Ultimately, we should have known this. You know, this is this is a hundred and you know, hundred and kind of hundred and three years before I even started school myself. Yet clearly, it hasn't been well known enough in in, in the teaching circles. And what it talks about is we forget forty percent of what we've been taught within the first day. So if you're a teacher and you're thinking that you've taught something to your students today, and they're going to remember it tomorrow and the day after and the week after or the month after, you are kidding yourself. If you don't do anything with that, if you don't go back and retrieve it and leave some time for them to forget it and then come back, they are going to forget it. And again, 90% within the first month. And when I started thinking about this in all of the, how I used to teach, I just wish I'd known this when I first started teaching because I would have definitely structured my lessons and my sequencing of lessons and my retrieval in a far different way. This idea that you use it or you lose it. So you've got to get them to use that knowledge again. They've got to retrieve it. They've got to come back to it in a few days time uh, or a week's time. And every time they retrieve it and it's more successful, it, it leaves a stronger memory trace. So the act of retrieval, the act of retrieving information actually strengthens the memory itself. That's the trick. So it's not about the scores that the students get. It doesn't matter about whether you write their scores down you know, in terms of your logbook. The low stakes quizzing aspect of retrieval and spacing helps the memory itself. And that's really important. It's not about the scores and it's certainly not about writing them down. And the longer we can leave that, you know, that, that spacing, the better our memory gets. It's a little bit like going to the gym. The longer you can leave it before you go back again, before, you know, if you're still fit, then, you know, the, the, you know, the, the better it becomes because you're working yourself quite hard uh, and, and it's, it's understanding how it works. So we're not just talking about retrieving it the day after. Can you leave it two or three days? Then if that's successful, can you leave it five or six days? If it's successful again, can you leave it two weeks, three weeks, four weeks? So gradually, we're increasing the length of time between the input and the retrieval. The Ebbinghaus forgetting curve, if you're not familiar with it, you know, if you Google it, you will see there that curve of the, the, the length of time and how quickly that information disappears from our students' minds. It's awful to look at as a teacher because you're thinking, all my hard work is slipping away very, very quickly. But if you don't understand that, you're assuming students will know this information and will remember it, but actually they're not going to. So it's really important for us to remember that. In terms of um, next bit of, uh, bit of uh, work, in terms of professors Robert and Elizabeth Bjork, who's done an enormous amount of work on, um, on, on, on retrieval, on spacing and on human memory, they talk about blocking. And we, we talk about that, that idea that blocking one topic all at once and teaching it all at once and trying to master it, might, it might produce initial better results. Okay, so we're not saying it doesn't work initially, it will probably provide better short-term outcomes. So students will probably end up doing better on a, on, a, on, a, on a test immediately than students that have been spaced and interleaved. However, long-term, the spacing works far better. And that's what we're in the game of, long-term learning. You know, summative assessments at the end of a two-year course. It's really important to remember that, that don't just think just because your students have done well on a test the week after you've stopped teaching it, that they've remembered it. It will produce those initial short-term gains, but it doesn't really you know, relate to long-term learning. And um, we talk about this, the Bjorks talk about this desirable difficulty, making sure we place levels of difficulty on our students that enable them to uh, learn far better in the long term. And by spacing things out, by letting students forget it and then have to retrieve it, that is placing a desirable difficulty on our students and it's making that far better in the long term. So don't be caught out by just thinking about short-term gains. It's about long-term learning that we're in the business of. Okay, moving on to interleaving then. So Nate Cornell and Robert Bjork um, talked about, they, they did a study about, they, they looked at different, the two different groups who looked at artists and, and paintings. One group studied uh, one, one artist at a time, like a, in a blocked method, and they mastered one artist at a time. The other group looked at, uh, had an interleaving aspect. So they looked at different artists at all different times uh, and they, they took a test at the end. Everyone thought that the group that mastered each artist one at a time would do better. 
but ultimately the interleaving group did far better. Uh, and that was because they were able to really discern between the real small details that made that art, made a painting from that artist, certainly you know, um, different to, to this artist because the small details, rather than just being in a comfort zone and seeing everything that from what, what that one artist. And that was really interesting that the interleaving certainly worked far better. However, all of the people that, that, that are in the that were in the blocking group all thought that that felt better to them. And this is what we need to remember that actually for our students, students will tell you that actually they like blocking better. They prefer that because they feel confident. But the, 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 the key here is in the, in the second sentence, it leads to a false sense of fluency. We think because we are um, because we're because we're comfortable with it, because we've seen it, because we are familiar with something that we mistake that for learning. And that's really that's really dangerous. And we need to make sure we remember that as teachers, that actually it's about long term learning and it's not about familiarity. And that's why, in terms of familiarity, we can't ever proofread our own work because we've read it before, we've seen it, and our eyes think we know what we've read. And it's that false sense of familiarity kicking in. Uh, when, you, when you block something together, it feels familiar, you feel comfortable, you think you know it, but actually you don't, as well as, as, well as, as, well as you may do it if you interleave. Really important to remember. And secondly, um, <coughs> Doug Rora talked about not only... I, when you and I talked about this at the start, you're naturally uh, putting spacing into your interleaving. So not only are you interleaving, you're also adding spacing. But importantly, what he found in his study was that actually it wasn't just the spacing that was in, that was making the uh, the performance gains. When he separated it out, he found that actually interleaving per se on its own was also massively beneficial. So it's not just the spacing that kicks in; it's the spacing and the interleaving and the contrasting that makes a big difference here. Okay, there's some practical strategies then. So how can we use this in our classrooms? So first thing, we can do cumulative testing. So if we're gonna teach, a, we're gonna teach block one and we're gonna test on block one, after we've test, after we've taught block two, put some questions in from, from block one as well. So you might have questions on block two and some on block one. When you've taught block three, teach everything from, you know, test on something from block one, two and three. So you're continually having that cumulative testing across the year and retrieval all the time. So there's that spacing built in. Having some lagged homework. So teaching something today, but giving a homework on it in a week's time or two weeks time, getting the students to almost forget it and then go back to it and have to retrieve it. So you're building in that natural level of spacing. Very easy to do. Next, Something similar, but not the same. So actually getting them to contrast against some different skills and see the difference or the different content, how it's slightly different and the intricate details. <clears throat> Our precise and strategic sequencing of lessons, how long we're going to leave between teaching this and teaching it again or asking them to retrieve it. And that comes down to your sequencing and your, your strategic kind of curriculum design, making sure that we're building in those natural elements of spacing and adding in other topics so we interleave topics together or different skills. So it comes down to curriculum design and not just teaching one thing after the next. Intelligent use of assessment and retrieval. So again, making sure that we're actually, again, intelligently using that, thinking about what we know about spacing. How can we use our assessment to add that spacing? How can we use that to actually you know, put that interleaving in there and that retrieval? Again, it's intelligent use of it, not just teach it, test it, teach it, test it. That's basic. We're more intelligent than that. We need to be more strategic about how we use the knowledge that we have from the science of learning and build it into our assessments. And finally on this, communication with students and parents, really key. If you start doing something like lagged homework and you teach it one day and put a homework in it two weeks later, the students will think you're crazy and they'll say, why are we doing this? We, you, know, you taught us this two weeks ago. It's too hard. The idea is you need to let students into the secrets. This is why we're doing it. This is this will this is this is a, a better optimum level of, of of spacing. It will increase your learning. Talking to parents about it, letting students in on this rather than them thinking that you know it's it's too hard for us. Okay, so a quick poll uh, towards the end of this this first topic here. Does your school traditionally block your lesson content together, or have you or your school began to space and interleave your content? So a quick poll here. Gary's going to jump in now and talk about how the poll's going to work. But it'll just be interesting to see where are you currently at with this? Have you started this or are you still in a very traditional method? So Gary, how are we going to do the poll? So I'm just going to launch the poll now. Hopefully you can see the poll on your screen. So you can just click on which one you um, 
to do, but do you block lesson content together or do you space them to leave? So we've got some votes already. Can you see that, John, on the screen? Yeah, I can, yeah. Quite interesting. How long are we going to give them, Gary? Give them 30 seconds or so? Yeah. Okay, happy with that? Should we shift on or are we going to give a little bit longer? Just give them another 10 seconds. I think we've got 62 out of 97 people voted. Okay, give them another five seconds. <laughs> okay, so we'll share the results. Yeah, just it, it's interesting. I just saw a comment put up there from Adam saying he is spacing into leaving, but his colleagues think he's bonkers. <laughs> Again, maybe maybe some some education for the rest of the staff there, Adam. In terms yeah. of you know you you know you're on the right track, but you need to bring everyone else up to speed. So can right, you see so, the John? Yeah, interesting, interesting. So sixty two percent are still blocking lesson content together. Hopefully that'll change. You know, after tonight, maybe start to to get people to think about why it is, uh, and to do it again. To, I, all I'm doing tonight is to hopefully open your mind into the possibilities of it, give you some sound bites of what the research says. And for you to go away and think about what it is, do some more reading. Um, and, and again, you really open your mind to, you know, to, to a different way of doing things. So, yeah, good stuff. Okay. Right. Let's shift on then. Okay. Um, so, the next, the next part that I want to do um, is learning versus performance I talked about. And I'm going to pose you a question just to think about, not, not to interact with. But the question is this. Can you really see learning or do you just see performance? So what I mean by that is, you know, you give somebody uh, a test, you give a, a student a test. Do you really see their real learning or is it just that they're performing at that any given point in time? And, and, and will that performance change positively, negatively, depending on lots of different factors? Um, and I think that's certainly a question to, to, to take with you over the next kind of few hours, days, weeks and months. And actually, next time you're doing an assessment, what are you actually assessing? Because I think that for far too long, we thought that we've been assessing learning, but there may be lots of different factors that are actually influencing positively or negatively the performance. Um, and, I, and I'll talk about that as we move forward in, in the next couple of slides. Okay, so in the, in the, in the Teacher 1.0 section, what we've been doing is that a lack of understanding for this has led to short-term performance gains or dips because actually we have influenced things negatively, positively, and we've taken this data as meaning that our students have cracked this, you know, they, 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 we, we can tick that section off or, or we've, we've improved them, but actually there's lots of, you know, students will go up and down for lots of different reasons. There's also been lots of positive and negative influences on performance that we haven't really understood. You know, think about the student that hasn't had any breakfast had an argument with his mum and dad the night before. Um, think about the fact that actually as a teacher, you have delivered a revision session the lesson before your assessment and you've positively influenced that assessment because why would you ever deliver a revision session on topics that weren't on the assessment that you've created? So you are already positively influencing the outcome of that test, okay? Then the students do well on the test and you say, oh, wow, they've all learned, they've all done really well. Well, of course they have. You delivered a revision session on the test that you had created the day before. It was always going to be you know, that way. And then they come to the exam at the end of the year and they don't do very well. And we're scratching our heads thinking, why did that happen? Well, we've probably been assessing you know, performance rather than learning. Um, and again, we, we, we've mistaken data for real learning uh, you know, for, and, and proper learning and, 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 and knowledge retention for a long period of time. So it's interesting to think about this and think about you know, what we're we actually doing. So the research behind this, so what does it say and why are we at this stage where we're having this question? Well, the first point is that what, 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 what Schmidt and Lee say is that um, we can't observe learning um, in, in, in performance that in, in terms of in, in the moment. We've got to observe it over time because actually anybody can perform negatively or positively at that given time, but actually over time, consistently, has that been learned and has it been retained? What they also talk about is the fact that we can't actually observe it during practice. 
because it's a poor kind of uh, proxy really for retention. Quite clearly, if I was with you and we were practicing a skill and I was giving you some help and I was, I was instructing you and I was talking you through it and I was watching you, I can't really make that claim right now that you have learned that. I need to give some time and come back and see whether or not you have actually learned it properly and it's stuck. Not the fact that you can do it now, but you can't do it tomorrow or you can't do it next week. Learning means that actually I know how to do this forever, okay? Not just for the next 10 minutes. So it's really important to make sure that we don't just uh, assess that learning during practice. We need to leave some time before we come back to it. <clears throat> and again, we, again, talking about when we need to come back to it, we need to assess it well after the practice has stopped. So again, adding that spacing into there or coming back more than once to actually see, has that stuck? Has it really learned? You know, for instance, if you passed your driving test, okay, actually what I really need to do is I need to see whether you can drive two weeks, three weeks, two years afterwards as well, not just at that given time. And let's face it, probably lots of us are watching this, may have, you may have your, passed your driving test the first time or the second time. It doesn't mean to say you were any better a driver the second time. You may just have had a problem the first time. Somebody may have pulled out in front of you. You may have had some nerves. Okay, so there's lots of things that influence it positively or negatively. Soderstrom and Bjork talked about um, long-term learning can be enhanced by intentionally impairing short-term performance. A real interesting thought. So by making it harder at the, um, at, at, at the point of practice, and by, by actually impairing short-term performance, by making it more difficult, actually improves long-term performance. Think about it. If we, if we make it too easy, okay, we're not going to have that long-term performance. So having those desirable difficulties and making the learning conditions harder actually increases the learning in the long term. And also, the more the, 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 the link to this, the conditions that, that, that induce the most errors are often the best conditions. So don't be deterred by actually the sense of difficulty that you're giving your students. It needs to be difficult, okay? You need to be worried that it's too easy. If students are getting things right you know, continually, that's not a sign of your great teaching. That's probably a sign that it's too easy and you're not giving enough difficulty and all you're seeing is performance and not real learning. Okay, so looking at some practical ways that we can implement this into our, into our teaching then. Adding some intelligent spacing to your, to your assessments making it difficult, okay? So making sure that it's not just in the moment of practice, okay? It's too easy. Short-term memory, they've been guided, they've been given some help by you. Let's leave it and come back to it, you know, well after that practice is finished and let's really see if they've learned it. Retest at a later date. And again, multiple times if need be. You know, go back in again, right? So if I tested you tonight and you all got 80% on a quiz that we did, would you get 80% in two days time or in two weeks time? So I go back in and I go, I, I, I go back in at a later date and I find out whether or not ultimately you, 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 you've done that and whether or not you've really learned it. Okay. Whoops, I'm just shifting back there. So, so again, stop delivering revision sessions prior to your assessments. It's in the best intentions. I know it is helping our students, but it's positively influencing them too much. Okay. Uh, especially if you've written the assessment yourself, even if you don't want to, you are, you, you are going to influence them in, in a positive way. And you might think that's great because surely that's my job to positively influence the outcomes of the students. But if you're going to take that data and say the students have learned and they've all done great, I think we, we were sadly mistaken. We need to remember what we're doing there. Um, next, um, using multiple inferences to judge learning. So again, not just off one assessment but actually how, what other things can we use to actually ascertain whether the students have learned or not, rather than just, wow, this student performed well on this test. That means they've learned it. It doesn't, okay? When we also write, when we write our own assessments and our own tests, we don't know how difficult those questions are. So what happens is we write an assessment for a student or for, for a class and a, and a student gets 40% on it, but we don't know how difficult those questions were in, in relative terms. The next assessment for the next topic, we write the questions and the student gets 60%. And we say, wow, the student has improved by 20%. Well, firstly, it's a different topic. Has the student really improved by 20% or have they just done better on that next topic? Also, how difficult were the questions in, 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 in kind of contrast and on similarity to each other? Maybe the second exam that you did on the test was a little bit easier. 
So we're making that inference that that student has improved by 20% when realistically have they a different topic, a different test. It's, we're on dodgy grounds if, we, if we're thinking that's the only way we're going to use or the only data we're going to use to it to infer learning. Next, um, we need to we understand that the factors that they influence our performance of student performance, whether it's internal, whether it's external, and all of those things. We, we've probably seen and had lots of students that we've taught that we know know something but haven't done well on a test because the question has tripped them up. And we also, on the other hand, probably know that students who've got very, very lucky and revised the, some, something the night before and it's come off on the test and they haven't learned it that much, but they've just become quite lucky on the test. So we need to be really, really careful about the factors that influence things. So end of this section here. Based on what you've heard about the learning versus performance, is there anything that you are now going to do or stop doing to ensure that you're measuring real learning. And we're gonna go back to that Jamboard again, or a different Jamboard, and we're gonna ask you to, again, fill out one of those uh, post-it notes, anything at all that you now know from what we've heard or from what you've been reading in the last few days or weeks that you're gonna start doing or stop doing to try and measure real learning rather than just performance. Okay, so a new Jamboard, off you go, fill in your post notes, we'll give you a couple of minutes quickly to get things on there. Gary, you want to say anything about that? Yeah, so just at the top, if you can see, there's a, a scroll to page number two that you'll find the new Jamboard. So at the top, you should see an arrow on yours. Just click on the next one and you should be able to write on that screen, hopefully. So yeah, anything that you're going to do or stop doing to try and ascertain real learning rather than just uh, performance. So straight away, stop doing revision sessions the week before the, 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 the mock paper. Yeah, staggered homeworks, fantastic. Retest a certain number of days afterwards. Yeah, all these things are really easy to do um, and can make a huge difference. Stopping revision, uh, liked homework, yeah. Um, and I think that you know it, it's, it's, in our, it's in our nature to want to do these revision sessions for people. Um, but actually, we are influencing it too much. Um, and, 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 and I just think we need to, as long as we understand that, um, then you know, we, we, might want to get, we might want to get the students to do some revision and get them to do something. But again, it's just how we do that and understanding you know, things there. Uh, revisiting, revisiting topics frequently, yeah, great. Um, testing a number of times afterwards, yeah, retesting at a later date. Uh, topics if they're too easy, retesting, intelligent gaps, yeah, fantastic. Avoiding giving clues about questions. Yeah, it's really difficult because when we're talking about things, if we know there's a question coming up on that test that you've written, naturally you will, you maybe emphasize certain words or you know, make sure you revise this. It's going to be really important for you. Clearly, you're, blat you're blatantly saying to the students, this is going to come up on the test tomorrow. Uh, again, they don't get that before, before their end of your, your exams, you know, their, their terminal exams. Um, not in teachers, it's a test. Yeah. Um, yeah, lots of great stuff there. Fantastic. Some great, great kind of stuff. And it's great to see kind of some collaboration of people firing some ideas in. And like Gary said as well, to be able to go back to that jam board after the session, to be able to see all those ideas, I think it's really useful and get a real collaborative feel of where we are. <clears throat> okay, let's shift on and go to the, to the next bit. Let's have a look. So we're now into the final section, which is the difference between cognitive load and dual coding, something that is uh, hot on people's lips, but I still don't think people know enough about the two uh, and the difference between the two and, and how they can be kind of used uh, effectively in the classroom. Okay, so cognitive load to start with. Okay, it, uh, in fact, I'll let you read that before I, before I talk about it. And I'll tell you why, that, why I'm doing that in a second. Okay, so it refers to the working memory of our brain. Our brain can only compute and have the capacity to work with certain things uh, at any given time. Think about when you're trying to read something and someone is talking to you. Your brain, if it's anything like mine, can't do those two things together. And, and you probably find yourself saying, I can't concentrate because you've got something else happening. So your brain has only got a certain amount of working memory to deal with things. Almost like, a, like your laptop, like your processor. If you've got too many windows open at certain times and you're trying to do multiple things, your computer starts to go on what I call a go slow. It can't process all those things at once. Exactly the same with our brain. We need to remember that for our students. Dual coding, okay, is different. And this is about how we present text alongside graphics together, okay? 
to take advantage of, of the verbal and the visual information channels that we use to encode information into our long-term memory, okay? Uh, and I'll talk about those uh, as, we, as we move forward now. So let's start with cognitive load, okay? So a lack of understanding of, of how we present information uh, has, has led to some real negative things in our classroom. So the first thing that we've led students, we've put students into what we call cognitive overload. We've overloaded their brains. Um, and, and, and partly that's sometimes part to our, our infatuation with things like PowerPoint. Um, and just because Microsoft PowerPoint can do something doesn't mean to say we have to do it. And we've got all these different colors, different backgrounds. We've got things that are flashing in the corner of the screen. We've got all this stuff going on. And actually it makes it very, very difficult for our students to concentrate. Imagine if I was speaking to you right now and all, all the time, I just kept doing this and taking your attention away from what I was saying, okay? So it's important that we understand you know, that that's been happening. Too much text has been, I've lost countless times how many I've, I've sat and watched teachers or watched uh, or been in professional development sessions, which is even worse, where people have got so much text on the board, okay? And all we start doing is we start trying to read it. And, and it's just an information overload. We, we can't process this all, all the time. And what that leads to is dual voices. What, that, the reason I said I was going to leave that on the screen for you a second before I talked about it is because when we put text on the screen, immediately our brains want to read it because we're clever human beings. So I'm going to give you something to read so your brain starts to read it. The problem is, is that you're, you will start to read it at a different pace in your head than I read it. So you have, you, you, there's a voice in your head reading it back to you and you've got my voice inputting it as well. So we have these two voices that are out of sync and you've got, it's very, very difficult to read it if it's not in sync. So if you're gonna put some text on the board, let people read it. Don't read it when, when they're trying to read it because you've got a, an out of sync going on and it creates a, a really bad cognitive overload situation that our brains just can't handle, okay? Next time that happens and you see something, think about it. Dual coding. The next, what we've got here on, the, on this next side is we've got a lot of missed opportunities, okay? And we've got missed opportunities because we're, we're not thinking about really how we can use those images, the icons and the text to take advantage of the second input source, which is, which is you know, the, the, the visual input source to make those memory traces. If you think about, if you talk about flashcards with your, um, with your students, what we always say is don't just write the answers on the flashcards, draw a little picture on as well. Okay, even if it's a stick man, because actually that will create that extra memory trace of, of, of remembering it. Think about what, how you remember things and you almost kind of sometimes looked up to the left or to the right and you can visualize things. So we can visualize as well as get that text. So we, if, if we're not using text and images intelligently again, not just randomly, but intelligently, we're missing an opportunity. Needless distractions, I talked about that idea of needless distractions and also this idea of kind of like a, a death by a PowerPoint. That just because PowerPoint can do it, doesn't mean to say we need to do it. We need to make sure we're, we're really controlling the information that our students are getting and we're not sending them into, into, into kind of cognitive overload. The research then, let's look specifically about cognitive load. And John Swallow talked about this way back in 1988, the year that I started secondary school, which I think is, is quite pertinent when I talk to people about this, that I really wish that my teachers had known about this when I was at secondary school. <clears throat> Three types of things that can add to our cognitive load. Intrinsic, extraneous, and germane load. The intrinsic load is how hard the content is for me to process, just the content itself. So if it's a difficult topic and I don't understand it, that's clearly going to take up quite a lot of working memory and processing power for me to think about if it's difficult. Secondly, there's the extraneous load, the external factors. You know, if I'm, if I'm struggling to hear it, or if there's lots of flashing images, or I can't read it properly, or there's some background noise, or someone's chatting, all of that is also creating that extra cognitive processing load for me to try and think about it. So if we're adding that on top of already a high intrinsic load, we're sending our students immediately into almost a red zone where it's too much for us. And the germane load is the actual kind of the hidden load really that our brain needs to do to process that information and add it to our networks to add it to other knowledge. Because we don't process knowledge as individual parts we have to add it to pre-existing knowledge to create schema so that has to go on in the background so all those things are happening so you can start to see 
how we need to make sure we, we reduce that extraneous load if we've got high intrinsic load. Um, like I said, if it's too difficult or unfamiliar, it'll occupy a significant uh, part of our mind. That's the intrinsic load. And if our brain's spending far too much time thinking about things uh, and having to process information in different ways, then we've, you know, we, we've got an unnecessary strain on our, on, on our brain. So it's really important to think about that and to make sure we get those, those levels right. The one thing to think to remember though, that if, you're in, if your intrinsic load is low, so if, if the content isn't as difficult, we might be okay with a higher extraneous load. But if we've got really difficult, challenging content, we need to make sure it's in its simplest form presented so we're not having to you know, block out that noise or strain to be able to see it or have lots of flashing things going on because it just makes it far too difficult. And again, the last point, not all cognitive load is negative, okay? Because we, 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 we need to actually connect that to make further schema uh, and there's things going on in the background to make, to make that work. So it's important to think that it's not just about the internal and external side of it, it's what's going on in behind, the, behind our eyes as well. And finally, the, 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 um, the research on dual coding. And this came from Alan Pavio in 1986, but it's actually, and I'm referring to this now because you, Gary will show you later on, uh, there's, a, there's a book by uh, Oliver Cavigliori, um, or he goes by the name of Oli Cav on, on his kind of website, has made, made really uh, dual coding come to life really in the last few years and done a fantastic book on how you can use dual coding really, really well. Um, he used to be a head teacher, but also he's a real graphic designer. So he's got those great skills that he can pull together and really demonstrate how this works. But the research behind it and the, the sound bites, again, it's processed in two forms. We mentioned that to start with, the verbal and visual, making sure we then actually take advantage of these forms and how they can complement each other together. So we have maybe icons like I've had tonight on the left-hand side in terms of, you know, that the same icons and the same color schemes. And when you, I've got a box around dual coding, so we know we're focused on that now. It's, it's not just about clip art and about throwing lots of pictures together. It's about how we use the right colors to focus our mind towards things um, and, and, and demonstrate things without, without being too busy. When we combine these channels together and we use it both correctly in terms of the text and the images, uh, we, we, they, they actually encode information far better in our long-term memory because they're using two different memory traces. Uh, you know, so it, it creates a, a far better memory trace. So again, why wouldn't we want that as educators? Um, and again, that, that double memory trace, it's far easier for people to then remember that image or remember, you know, what, that, you know, what, what was said, you know, because I can see that image and it, it starts to link to something else and it, it creates a better schema and a better memory trace. Um, and again, this is a brief introduction to this. When you start to know this and delve into it far more, you can start to see really intelligently how to use it. But certainly if you've not thought about this before, just initially to at least you know, take away that we have those two memory traces and we need to be able to use it to, to further encode that information. Is, is, is a huge win to start with. And you know, Dylan William talks about the fact that, you know, cognitive load especially, it, it's probably the most important thing that, that educators can know about because actually we send students into cognitive overload far too many times without us knowing. Because unfortunately there isn't a, there isn't a flashing lights going on in students' head where we can see when they go into cognitive overload. Unfortunately, it's behind the scenes and we don't know. So by using dual coding correctly, by using it intelligently, by looking at, uh, the right colors, the right, you know, the right schemes, the right uh, images, the right icons, uh, again, in, in enhancing what we know we're doing, then it can start to make a big difference. And again, it can help to reduce our cognitive load, which ultimately has got to be better because we can leave more brain power and processing power to do things with. So how can we put that into action? Some quick ideas and some quick um, methods. Increasing the general knowledge around the subject. If we increase the general knowledge around the subject, we're not having students spending far much more processing power remembering that information and taking up that information if we know it and it's 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 um it's automatic it can make it can save all that process and power to do other things with strong routines and habits if students don't have to think about what to do and how to do it in new routines in your classroom again if, if things are automatic they can have that other brain power to solve the information with and to solve tasks with rather than you know we we're doing a new thing there a new routine or Get students into habits where it's just automatic. I imagine, like me, when you get in your car in the morning to drive to work, you're not consciously thinking about moving the gear stick and what to do. It's automatic. You've got all that extra brain power to do everything else with. That's what we need to get our students into the habit of. Removing unnecessary distractions from our presentations, noise, whatever it may be. 
avoiding split attention. So producing things together. If you've got a graph with some data, get the data on the graph. Don't have the data here and the table here because I'm having to look left and right to process information. Have it together. Again, make it easier on the eye to understand this and, and, you know, and, and be better in terms of cognitive load. Using graphics and text together. Again, look at the work that Ollie Carver's done and, and how he's really used that to, and if you've seen any of the, you know, a lot of the new books um, that, he's, that he's producing and he's doing graphic designs for, you can see the illustrations are really clear and they make a massive difference and they make an impact uh, on, on, on our eyes. And lastly, the, the intelligent use of icons and colors. Again, intelligent use, not overuse and not just flooding the, flooding the, the, uh, the, the presentations. You know, I, again, I've used carefully chosen icons tonight to help you know, lead, lead, lead your eyes to certain areas on the presentation and to think about things and to have those consistent icons that pop up at certain points so you know what's coming. Okay, last question then. Whoops, go back one. Sorry, thinking about how you present information. This one. So we just skip this one, I'm just thinking about time. Yeah, that's fine, no, no, that's no problem at all. Yeah, that's fine, okay. Right. Shift that on then. So if you want to know more about this, I, like I said, I've, I've, I've written about this in my book. If, there's, if you want to, you can get it from direct from Bloomsbury or from Amazon. I've talked about all those areas in more detail and lots more in terms of assessment, questioning, uh, metacognition, et cetera, et cetera, retrieval. Feel free to pick up a copy. And if you want to, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can do. I mentioned that you can, um, you can um, get in touch with me on social media and I'm happy to answer your questions. I'll do that Q&A at the end of this. But if you want to get in touch with me afterwards, feel free to do so. Um, and shifting forward one second. We talked about that selfie. Here's your opportunity again. If you haven't taken that selfie to start with, take a quick one now. You know, where are you in the world? What you know, what, what have you learned tonight? Um, take that selfie with you next to your laptop. It'd be great for people to see it. Use that hashtag TNT Science of Learning, and it would be great to see all those flooding in to social media tonight. Um, so yeah, that is me. I, it's been a pleasure kind of speaking to you. I'm gonna pass over to to back to, to Gary and Avril now to take you through from here uh, and I'll be with you for the Q&A. Over to you, Gary. Thank you. Okay, so based on uh, previous feedback, um, people have requested a, an additional reading list. So on the screen, you can see, obviously, we've got John's book there. Um, some of the other books that you can see on the screen uh, is some that I've read and, and some that have Gary have read and, and some that have been recommended by colleagues. I've also put the links to um, the EEF, which has got lots of research that they've already done. And also the Learning Scientist is another resource that's linked to this topic. So strongly recommend you have a look on those if you're wanting to do some uh, further research and, and have a read of those books if you want to, to delve further into the science of learning. Okay, just want to say a massive thank you um, to the following people. Um, first of all, Elementary Technology, who are a technology company uh, in the UK. They specialise in uh, visualisers, interactive whiteboards, and um, lots of uh, classroom technology. They've been very busy at the moment with uh, the lockdown stuff uh, and people teaching at home and remotely. Um, they support us by allowing us to use their webinar software, and they also give us prizes for competitions. Um, Tassamai are a, a company which are an intelligent online learning programme. Um, so they, they do science, maths and English and they basically have a series of uh, different quizzes and uh, low state quizzes that students can take. And the reason why we chose Tassima is they use in their program um, the science of learning. So they use interleaving, they use spacing in their program uh, and they use an algorithm to um, really test pupils that they're struggling in consistently all the time, coming back to it, um, just like John talked about tonight. So if you've not looked at that and you've, you know, science, English and maths, it's a really, really good program to, to have a look at. Thank you again to John. There is, there is his, um, his social media tags that you can follow John on. You can ask John any questions afterwards. And obviously the, the Bloomsbury uh, publishing as well, uh, who I believe, John, I'm not too sure, but they were the originators of the Harry Potter series. Uh, I'm sure I read some, something like that online. Um, but they've got an ed education section specifically for um, you know, library books for your school, for CPD books for staff classroom resources, there's loads of stuff that you can and go and check on, on that website. So I just want to do a quick mention of our previous winners. So the last uh, webinar that we did, we had two £25 vouchers for Amazon and uh, the two lucky winners are there. We had three prizes um, for the Paul Dix book and uh, that's 
obviously the three got given out for that and the fantastic 50 pound uh, prize money for from class charts where you got to eat out a, a meal for two up to the value of 50 so michael actually actually was really lucky and, and won two prizes there he won that and also um one from the positive teacher company so we're just really really grateful for all these companies to to help support our our webinars and and give some rewards back to, to teachers and participants okay so the thing we like to do is give away prizes uh, so elementary technology kindly again donated two prizes of 25 pound amazon vouchers to spend on teaching stuff uh, so you can't buy a new toaster unfortunately and um, tasamai um, who are supporting us and um, they've got this new feature on their website which is like a, a tree and each branch represents a different topic each twig represents a subtopic and every time pupils complete questions in the quiz the the leaf uh, if they get them right consistently the leaf goes greener and greener so students can see visually whereabouts um, topics they're struggling with, they're consistently getting questions wrong, and ones which they're strong, strong in. And that's for English, maths and science. So they're giving us two real trees. So there's lots of different trees that you can, you can win and you can choose if you do win. Uh, and they'll get delivered to your house. You can plant them in your garden or at your school or wherever you want to. Uh, and then finally, um, we we're going to give away two copies here, but we're actually going to give away three copies of John's book. Now, Bloomsbury said, if you already have that book, uh, they will give you another copy of a different book of your choosing uh, if you've obviously already bought John's book. So there's three copies uh, of John's book to give away. Um, all you need to do to win those prizes is when you end this webinar, there should be the Google form automatically loaded. If not, I'll put the link in the chat. Just fill in the feedback form. If you want to enter the competitions, then please fill in your name, email address, uh, so we can contact you if you, if you win. We'll do random draws um, next next week. Um, so it closes week today at 3.30 and we'll announce the winners later that week on our social media. So if you want to check out our social media, there are our Facebook page, our Twitter and our YouTube channel. So on there you can see our past webinars and also other teaching and learning videos uh, to check out as well. Please subscribe to us um, if you want to keep updated of future webinars. The next webinar we think we're doing course towards um, November bonfire night in the UK is we're looking at differentiation, uh, especially for SEND pupils and lower ability pupils. So that's our next webinar coming up. We've got another special guest, which we'll announce shortly on uh, social media as well. So please follow us um, and uh, we'll ask us any questions you want. Finally, then just got a couple of minutes, John, to do a bit of Q&A, if you're happy with that, John. So we've got yeah, uh, yeah, fire away. nine questions. Um, are there any schools you'd recommend to see spacing interleaving curriculum design that you come across, John? Um, I, th I think that lots of schools, I mean, you know, certainly in the UK, are really thinking about that now. I, I, I haven't got any that I would like to kind of put on the spot right now and say, you know, with everything that's going on with COVID, that they, they kind of they would be visiting. But I just think that it, it, it's certainly on people's lips at the moment, you know, in terms of that. And I think that sometimes it, it, it's... Yeah. You can't, it's, you can't necessarily see it on a day visit, I suppose. It's about it's about the strategic implementation behind it um, and just making sure that if you want to space things out and you, you want to kind of interleave it, just sit down, get your plans out, you know, and actually think about putting those things in place. I think, you know, if you, a lot of Facebook groups as well that you might want to go on and do curriculum design in your areas, you can ask that question. I'm sure people are happy to share their curriculum design with people that might involve spacing interleaving. Um, next one. Uh, what impact does a teacher's voice and physical presence at the front of a class have on the impact of learning? Uh, huge, um, in, in, in a nutshell. I think your, your presence is, is massive, how you use your pitch, your tone, your volume. Um, you know, if you're a loud teacher, generally you will have a loud class. Um, and I think that is because sometimes the students just, you, the students are loud, so you keep getting louder and it just keeps, I think it's about, sometimes taking your taking your you know taking it down a notch and, and, and being quieter if you want quieter classes rather than raising your voice to get them to be quiet it's about taking it the other way but certainly your presence uh, and at the moment teaching from the front of the class in terms of your kind of your box your technical area wherever you're allowed then then that that is absolutely huge we just lost you there john the same got a bit absolutely yeah there we go right next one john how much general knowledge do you advise I'm often thinking of connecting left field connections to the current topic I'm delivering. I think the more you can give concrete examples, 
to what you're teaching is really important. So even if it's not, you know, if you're talking about a math solution and you, and you can talk about it in, in, in terms of something that they can actually see and physically do, right? I always remember um, a guy called, uh, a fantastic speaker called Harold Roberts uh, that some of you may know, and he talked about how he used to teach maths. And he went in and talked about the fact that, um, you know, he was he was making it relevant because he, he said, oh, you know, I've just had a flood in my, in my in my house. We need to kind of get the carpets and we need to measure all the carpets up. And again, it was about, so it was, he was using that general knowledge of actually a house and carpets. And ultimately it was a maths lesson. But the kids really believed in him. So I think that the more you can make it relevant, but the more you can bring other knowledge outside that can connect to something that can create a, you know, a, a more of a, um, I suppose, an informed picture of everything. And, and people can latch onto something as a concrete example, then, 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 then you know, the, the, the better you can be. Um, it's difficult in terms of timelines, but you know, the more intelligent we are about, about other things, the more we can then have informed opinions. And I always say knowledge, you know, more knowledge lets you know more things. You know, knowing things lets you know more things. Um, you know, it all connects and, and, and links to each other. Thank you. And then someone's just put, uh, can you repeat the name of the man who uses graphics? I think it's Oliver Caviglio. We will send out this PowerPoint with the recording <laughs> tomorrow via email and the, his books on the recommended reading list, so you can look it up from that. Um, I'm, I'm sure there is, John, but do you know if there's a Microsoft version of Jamboard? I'm sure they brought a new feature on the Microsoft Whiteboard or something like I think it's called. Yeah, I think so. I, can't, I don't know the name of it, um, but there is, there, is definitely something, there is definitely something out there. I think that because Teams and you know, Gene, uh, Google Meet, etc., et they're just constantly kind of wanting to kind of shift the boundaries. So I don't know what it's called, but I, but I, I don't think it would take much to be able to kind of search for it and find it. Yeah. And then, oh, sorry. Do you find that departments work together closely? Testing can be more effective. So by swapping test material, etc. cetera. Um, but there's some, someone from, a, not a teacher, but they're looking to change into secondary education. I think working close with other departments. Yeah, um, I, th I think it's you know, looking at actually, again, across the whole school, how is assessment working and when we're using it? Um, it's different in terms of different subject, you know, knowledge in terms of how, you know, what you would do. But in terms of assessment design, and what we're assessing and how we're assessing it, I think the more we're working together, the more we're talking about you know to each other. I think that's always going to be a, that's always going to be a um, uh, you know a win for everyone in terms of you know, how you design your assessments. What are they for? Again, we could do a whole lot on assessment. There's, there's a lot kind of in my book about assessment, but the more we talk about that together and, and, and get the right assessments for the right purposes, I think that that's always got to be beneficial. Okay, thank you, John. Um, just got one. So one issue they have right now is that is the problem I observe with working memory with our students across the board. How can we push for retrieval practice and related techniques when the material is not even getting past working memory? Uh, so it's not getting past working memory, right? So, what, so they're not understanding it to start with. I suppose, well, I suppose I suppose it comes back to that instruction of how can we get students to understand it to start with, you know, and, and moving that. But regular and often low stakes quizzing. Because what's interesting is that the word test doesn't fill any of us with any joy, but lots of us probably go to pub quizzes and we like quizzes. So it's about you know changing that round and, and that constantly kind of trying to you know to, to, to test them on things, but in a, in a nice way in terms of quizzing, getting that retrieval going all the time, little and often. Um, but yeah, you, clearly the, the students have to understand it at some point from an initial instruction point of view, and then it's that kind of leaving the space in lots of low sticks quizzing, maybe a quiz at the start of the lesson in terms of what we did last week, uh, last week, last unit, last month, you know, adding that extra spacing in and just make it a regular routine and part of your lesson that ultimately students know they're going to constantly be quizzed on information. The more it happens, the more hopefully they'll be able to retain that information. And I think as well, it's about how you, you teach it in a different way. So if you've not understood it the first time, then you try and teach it in a different way, try and differentiate it. And, you know, so it's more simpler for some of the students and try it that way as well, I think. And then once you've got that knowledge, then you can start using these techniques to test. Um, someone's asked about low ability. We are doing a, another webinar in a, in a month's time on uh, how to help low ability students. So I think we'll bring some of this research in with that as well. Um, yes, uh, I have used Jamboard when I've done live teaching um, for getting pupils feedback on certain things. It's a great way that you can send out to pupils as well afterwards and upload it to assignments or Google Classroom. Um, I think it's a really good way of using it. Um, someone's asked about doing a session. If you just put that in the feedback, Aruba, we'll, we'll do that. Um, 
So it would be good to get feedback as to what pupils have understood when it's relatively fresh in the memory. I think that's just a comment. And then last one, do we get a certificate for attending the webinar or any confirmation of attendance? If you do want a certificate, if you join our Facebook group, I will be putting a post on there uh, in a couple of days time uh, asking for anyone who wants a certificate and uh, I will then just email you uh, with that certificate for attending the webinar. And I think that's it. So, John, thank you very much again for giving up your time. Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, and joining us today. Hopefully you found this useful. There will be an email going out tomorrow with the link to the PowerPoint and the recording of this uh, uh, thing as well. And we'll put it onto our YouTube channel and on various Facebook groups as well. Um, please recommend it to other people if you enjoyed it. Please fill in the feedback form and hopefully we'll see you again soon uh, at our next webinar in a month's time. So thanks, John. Thank you, Avril. Thank you very much. Thank take you. That, if you have minutes, take that selfie. Take that selfie and get it. Get There's it posted. already been some on Twitter. There's oh, been brilliant. a few on Twitter, yeah. Fantastic. I'll have a look. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye. See you later.